I want you to meet someone, an artist who inspired me so much and who I've been lucky enough to spend some time with recently. Back in 2005, July 5th to be exact, 18 years ago, my mother took me to a gig at Salisbury City Hall to see Suzanne Vega, with support by an artist called Narina Paolo. I was completely blown away by her performance, as was everyone else. She had the entire room spellbound, and not only was she an incredible singer and guitarist, she played the piano in such a virtuosic way that at the time I just hadn't seen that before in pop music. I queued up to meet her at the merch table to buy her CD and tell her how much I loved seeing her play, and that I played guitar and piano and wanted to be just like her one day. Then she asked a question that I genuinely think changed my life. Do you write your own songs? Well, no, not yet. But that night I went home, picked up my guitar and wrote my first original song called She, which I still perform. It was just one of many moments for her that day. She probably met a hundred people that evening alone, but that little interaction was pivotal for me. She inspired me to take the first step on this wonderful journey. And when I think about what I want out of my career, I often ask myself, what would Narina do? Because she's exactly the sort of artist I want to be. 22 years on from the release of her debut album, she's still active, still making great music and doing it entirely independently too. She's built a loyal fan base that are completely committed to her and her work. She's an inspiration. And a few months ago, Narina was kind enough to invite me to her home studio where we talked about all kinds of things, including songwriting, the music industry, mental health, management, touring, and top of the pops. But before we get into it, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. In 2001, Narina released her debut album, Dear Frustrated Superstar on Polydor, a division of Universal Music Group. Despite respectable reviews, including the somewhat inevitable comparisons to Alanis Morissette, the record failed to chart and Narina and Polydor parted ways. It was, in her own words, an expensive failure. A good record, not a great one, which the label didn't know where to position, neither poppy nor weird enough to break through. Not necessarily in terms of the public eye, because if it had been in the public eye, I'd probably sell some copies, but within terms of the music industry, it was a very expensive failure. So um, it was a real baptism of fire. And I think it just, I made a record that was neither fish nor flesh. It wasn't quite commercial enough to really go the distance, but it wasn't creative enough to build me a sort of more artistic following so the indie press never knew what I was and the pop press didn't really admit me to the pop pantheon because I wasn't in S Club 7 or Steps so I was just in this nether world really I don't even know where the album got did it get into the top 75 anyway the big single got to number 61 which nowadays 61 is not so bad but back then that was that was not good news dropped by her label she feared her career was over before it had begun but this setback was to be the making of her because narina believed in herself knew she had something to offer the world she poured her energies into finding a way to fund her next record the self-released fires sophia is one of my all-time favorite songs and this album is absolute perfection and just transports me back luckily i had a publisher i've always i've had for Apart from a brief break where he left the industry, I've had the same publisher for 24 years this year. So that's like, he is just the most amazing person. And he always believes in me. And he said to me, don't worry, because what you're writing now is much better than that record. And it will all come good. And I think at that point, I hadn't written Everybody's Gone to War, but I'd written a song like Mr. King um, and Damascus. And... And I think the record company at the time were horrified that that was how I was going to somehow rescue my career, so they dropped me. But that did actually give me a career on the second album, Those the songs. And they were born of a lot of failure and a lot of disappointment and a lot of just trying to figure, you know, stuff out. So I think those things can be miraculous, you know. Narina's publisher, Chrysalis, continued to believe in her and provided an advance on her second album. When that didn't cover the expenses, she resorted to loans and credit cards to finish it. Everything had been quite easy up until that point. So my whole life I'd been told I was brilliant and I won a music scholarship to a, a very good school here in the UK. And then, you know, I went to music college and I was really good and I was really writing songs. And then I had a brief period working in the music industry in a record label and I got signed out of that whole thing it was all like no challenges nothing here here's a heap of money here you go go and make your album in america go and do what you want go and have bog clear amount to mix your album um 
And so up until that point, I thought that's how it's going to always be, you know. So I had a rude awakening. And that's when I knew I had to do it, that it wasn't about the nice journey and, oh, let's go on, you know, business class to Los Angeles. That was none of that was what was really making me tick. What was making me tick was my songs I had to write and watching people sing them back to me. And so I might never have known that, you know. You, you find a way to make it happen. Fires was independently released in 2005. Narina hit the road, both solo and as a support act, scouring a new site called Facebook for fans of Tori Amos and inviting them to her show. She began selling more and more CDs, including a copy to yours truly. Then I garnered enough radio play and press for it to get picked up by a major and then they gave it a large audience. So I wouldn't have the fan base I have without that, you know. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Labels took note and she signed to 14th Floor Records, a division of Warner, who remixed and re-released the album with added strings. Its single, Everybody's Gone to War, was a hit, reaching number 14 in the UK singles chart and gained heavy rotation on music channels and radio. The follow-up, Sophia, was nominated for an Ivor Novello Award for Best Song. That same year, Narina was nominated for a Brit Award in the Best British Female category. It ended up being won by Amy Winehouse, but there's no shame losing out to that astonishing talent. She also got to fulfill a lifelong dream, appearing on top of the pops, although not everything went as planned. So this is, a, this is interesting. This is careful what you wish for. So I can, I've got vivid memory. I'm five years old. I'm in my mum's orange golf. And she says to me, so what do you want to do with your life? I'm going to go on top of the pops, mummy. That's what I'm going to do with my life. She's like, yes, and, but no, but what are you really going to have? No, I'm going on top of the pops. So your whole life... Of course, there'll be people watching who won't have ever seen Top of the Pops, right? Because it stopped shortly after I did it, so it's been gone for about 16, 17 years. But that was what it meant to me, was going on Top of the Pops. And I went on it, and all I can remember is pressure from the label that I wasn't top 10 that week. And they were doing it where they would pre-record you. They would do two shows and one filming. And some people would be the prereq that they'd send out later in the show, and then some of you would go live on the actual show. But you didn't get told that till five minutes before. And I, five minutes before, was told, oh, you're doing this live. It's live. Live vocal to track. So it's like, okay, that's fine, I can do that. But the monitoring is atro or was atrocious at the BBC at that point. Mm -hmm. And all I can remember is the first bar and I couldn't hear a thing. And I was like, I'm going live to the nation. I can't hear anything. I must sound awful. And I watched it once and all I could see is this blank look of terror. People probably thought I looked quite cool. I was just terrified. Terrified and horrified that I couldn't hear what I was singing. How could they do that? They do, that's, that's telly. Music is always the casualty in live telly. And imagine your whole life you've dreamed of this. Mm. Three and a half minutes. Your whole life is culminating in this three and a half minutes. And it was deeply traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> how, did you, how did you feel the next day? Well, I had the mother of all hangovers. But it was, it was literally, this was my life. So I finished at the BBC. And in your, when you're a kid, you imagine everybody at Top of the Pops is hanging out with one another in the dressing rooms, right? You imagine that all the stars are there. The best thing, the only nice thing from that day was Fern Cotton told me she liked my dress. And then I was bundled into an Addison Lee to go home. And I was really hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. So I went to my local off license, bought a bottle of Jacob's Creek and a Linda McCartney veggie meal. And I went home and my flatmate was there going, are you OK? Which could have only meant it was totally sh because she had watched it. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and then I literally went up to my room with my veggie meal bottle of wine and I woke up the next day. I think I was just, I'd just fallen asleep. Terror, like absolutely devastated. Yeah. Oh my Lord. Yeah, in, in, a, in a house share in Brixton. They don't tell you that happens after Top of the Pops. Despite the success of fires, Narina parted ways with her management. I got fired by my manager. So what happened was, the day of the Ivan Novellos, where I was up for the best song, my manager effectively fired me, or she just turned up really late. And look, at the time I was really hurt, but looking back I understand what had happened, as I think she thought that she was going to make a fortune with me, and it didn't quite work out like that. And I think she had to make a living, and I think she decided she wanted a change of lifestyle. 
But um, about two weeks later, or two days later or something, I went in to see my publisher and she was already in the office and she'd already told him that she was effectively quitting managing me. But then I walked in and there she was to say, I'm really sorry, I don't want to do this anymore, bye. <laughs> so I was left, literally left unmanaged. But I had all this stuff I had to do, like radio, telly, stuff in you know Europe. But I was managerless. And I sort of was like, Oh, but my husband, who's literally the most amazing person and also hugely resourceful, was like, we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. And we figured it out and we trundled on. And then for a period, I looked at getting other management and I would meet with perfectly nice management. But I would think, well, what? You don't believe in me the way I believe in me and my husband believes in me. And why? You're going to tell me you're going to do all these things. But are you really going to give a shit at three in the morning that the artwork's not right or that we haven't sold this amount of tickets while I'll be up at three in the morning worrying about these things? And I never met a manager who could really make me believe that they believed in me as much as I believed in myself. But she wasn't deterred. Her next album, The Graduate, showcased a new confidence in her abilities. After touring fires, she completed a degree in English literature, wanting to improve her lyric writing and released on her own Idaho label, it marked a change in sound. Its critics thought that moving away from the commercially successful formula of fires was a mistake. But true artists make the music they want to make, not what they think will be successful. And an album's worth of material written with pop hitmakers Lyndon Perry, Rick Knowles and Rob Davis was scrapped because it didn't feel truthful. In an interview at the time, Narina said, I finally realised that on my own, I was more honest and less self-conscious and wrote my best songs. I really respect this decision because it would have been the easy path to compromise on your art, to be something you're not, in return for airplay. For her fourth album, Narina signed with another major, Geffen Records, releasing Year of the Wolf in 2011. Written while pregnant with her son, Wolfgang, and produced by Bernard Butler of Suede alongside Narina's husband and collaborator, Andy Chatterley, it showcased Narina's talent for crafting intelligent pop music. The opening, Put Your Hands Up, was originally intended for Kylie Minogue, who Narina has written for on the side. So writing, f you know, the, the pitch bit industry, the writing for other people, I sometimes dip my toe in it and I find that that is fantastic for being more creative in some ways. You know, the pop stuff I do on the quiet is nothing like my own records. It's like a, I just, I'd go do Lally if I didn't have that outlet to make really, really doff pop things. A young child meant her ability to tour was limited and she'd become tired of the traditional record, tour, record, tour cycle. So she decided to set herself a new challenge. In 2014, Paolo spent 12 months recording 12 EPs of five songs in a project she titled The Year of the EPs. Following fan feedback, much like my own songbook releases, the best tracks were selected alongside three new songs to form a new studio album, The Sound and The Fury. I think now I, I listen to feedback over the years. I used to be quite, not dismissive, but scared of it, you know. Um, but I would always rather listen to fan feedback than I would a label or something. Because like you really, it's, I hate to use the word customer, but your fans are effectively your customers. So in every other industry, you have customer feedback, right? If you're making a product, if the widgets don't work properly, you're going to go back and you're going to fiddle with them and make it so that they work so that people are happy with their product and they keep returning. I want repeat customers. So the basis of that is I feedback, what have I learned? Why do people like what I do? They like my words. They like feeling that they belong in a little club. They like the niche. I think there's nothing to be ashamed of about a niche. In fact, all humans want to feel part of a niche. Narina's released two more albums since, 2017's Stay Lucky and 2022's I Don't Know What I'm Doing. She's the type of artist I want to be, one who can live a normal life, make music, play shows and connect with fans, rather than being on a punishing, never-ending world tour. She balances touring with a family, she's still writing and recording all the time, and continues to get better. Just before Christmas, for the first time in my life, I lost my voice completely. And I lost it two days before I did this annual Christmas show where I've been doing it for about 12 years and people fly in from all over the world 
and we do a lunch and then we do a sound check and then I do a show which is probably 50% Christmas songs and 50% of my normal songs um, but we this was the first one back since the pandemic so it was a really big deal and I kept holding out hope that my voice would come back and it didn't and I managed to do the sound check and squeak out a few notes and then it completely packed up um, but the, the the amazing support act called Lucy May Walker she carried half the main set and then fans came up and sang my songs and it was probably one of my favourite gigs of all time and people in the room just surrendered to it and sang along from beginning to end and we got through it and I literally stood on the stage sort of just looking at everybody and playing in my own band but not singing um, and it was really amazing and humbling and then it made me really scared because I thought what if my voice never comes back and what if I haven't there's so many songs I want to write um, and my voice did come back but it came back a, a lot like it took a few weeks I don't want to waste any time and I've wasted so much time before I think I could have made so many more albums, I could have written so many more, there's so many things I could have done. Um, and I just, that's it now, I'm just gonna, for as long as I can, I just wanna stay on this wave and just make work, as much as work as I can. Because I, I don't know how long I've got really, how any of us, how long any of us have got really. If you like the sound of her and her work, she's on YouTube, all the streaming platforms, and writes a brilliant Substack newsletter too. I've also put the full hour interview over on Nebula, so check that out. And Narina, thank you for everything. And as always, thank you for watching until the end of this video. I'm now going to go a little deeper on why I think you should subscribe to Nebula the sponsor of this video. My career has already had a lot of ups and downs, just like Narina's, but that's what you can definitely expect when you're forging your own path as an independent artist. If you want to hear more about my journey, then check out The Freedom of Failure, a Nebula exclusive. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service. I put all my videos there, plus long-form videos that wouldn't work on YouTube, exclusive behind-the-scenes content, interviews, studio diaries, making of videos, and my full-length documentary, The Making of Song Look. You can also check out my friend Adam Neely's first Nebula class, Capturing Musical Performances, where he teaches you everything you need to know to make a professional grade video for your music. There are so many great videos there, ad free, and you can help me and other creators keep doing what we're doing. Sign up using the link in the description below, but otherwise I'll be seeing you here very, very soon.